All right. Um, so I am Ann Scheiman, um, and you could really just say my last name. My, my parents kind of named me, and they destined for me to go into GI, because if you look at my, my last name, it's Scheim Ann. So really, you can just say my last name, and you got my first name. But then if you look at it, I'm from Cincinnati, and Procter & Gamble is in Cincinnati, Ohio, and they have a toilet paper that everybody loves. It's squeezably soft. So growing up, uh, we were always teased and called, please don't, don't squeeze the Charmins. So um, yeah. <laughs> So I, I think it was kind of in my destiny to go into GI. So I, I um, you can kind of guess that that's you know kind of how I roll. And if people that know me in the audience, with some of the people out there do, they kind of know that you know I I am a little bit colorful, but most people in my specialty are. Um, and I have allegiance to both you know to Maryland, Cincinnati, which is where I'm from, and then also Texas. And I sometimes think that there's a hidden reason why. I screwed up, so if you see me tonight, I will probably have the shoe that I should have brought with me, because uh, I brought flats, but I brought two different black flats. So I've been stuck in these cowboy boots since I came here, and they are killing my feet. So I cannot wait, but I think it's because I needed to give this talk today. So anyway, we're gonna get started, and I'm gonna do a little bit of a review of the digestive misuse in prader willi syndrome. Um, and so I, I do have a few disclosures. Um, you know, I have some research support, you know, with, with some pharmaceutical companies. Um, they will not have any role in what I'm going to be talking about today, as well as grant support from FPWR and from the National Institutes of Health um, and NIMH. And then I will be talking about some off-label use of medications. And I'm, I'm also, you know, I, I'm, a me I'm the president of our NASPGIN Foundation, and I'm also a member of the board of directors of PWSA USA. And again, thank you so much for letting me come, and I'm part of IPWSO. All right, so what I'm gonna cover is, I mean, well, first off, the first thing is kind of obvious. If I'm talking today, then it, there must be some, and there's some people sitting out here in the audience, and it's not because they're eating food, which is usually when I give talks, and I would have loved to have had that talk out there. That's like my favorite time. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about how common are GI symptoms in prader willi syndrome, and then I'm gonna give you a little bit of a review of the published clinical data management appro approaches, some of which are evidence-based, and other, others are gonna be experiential in prader willi syndrome. Again, focusing in on, uh, like, essentially really three areas in particular, which is gonna be feeding and swallowing along with oral health, um, a little bit on gastric emptying and gastric dilatation at the end, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you know, kind of bowel issues. Um, again, going back to my name, I, I have to because, you know, it's close to my heart. Um, so how common are GI-related symptoms? If you actually go back to 1993, um, it was a major criteria for prader willi syndrome diagnosis where people would be worried because infants would be born and they'd have feeding problems. Um, and then if we look at other things, there's frequent reports of reflux symptoms as well as some concern about uh, children and adults with prader willi syndrome having difficulty with vomiting. They can vomit sometimes, but oftentimes it's not a very common feature, and it will raise more of an angst if there are those kind of symptoms present. One of the problems in prader willi syndrome that most people are aware of is that there is significant morbidity from very high pain tolerance. And, and then also having a difference in vomiting threshold is well documented. But if you go to the emergency room, you know, and you see a surgeon, or you see one of my colleagues who does GI, or you see an ER physician, oftentimes they won't recognize the level of concern that there should be, that this is not just your typical seven-year-old who's got a stomach bug, who just doesn't want to eat a little something, that this may be more than that. Um, so I think that's you know, a little bit of part of the problem, is getting people, giving them some education. So hopefully that's gotten a little bit better over time. So I'll take a pause for a second just to make sure. I know yesterday Dr. Bedard said she talks fast. I think we're both from the Midwest. I tend to talk fast. So I just want to make sure the speed is okay. I can try to slow down a little bit and go into a little bit of y'all and fixing if I need to to make sure people are all right. Okay. All right. So if we look at how common this is, this is actually a, an old study um, that I pulled together data. Whoops. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to jump ahead. Um, with pulled data from... Barbara Whitman, Susie Cassidy, and then from J.B. Butler. And if you look at the prevalence of uh, symptoms, I don't think I have an arrow. I don't know that I do. Oh, I, oh, right. I think I do. That's all right. Oh, here we go. I got an arrow here. Okay. If we look at the sy symptom prevalence among adults with prader willi syndrome, at the bottom of the graph here, it says respiratory symptoms, which is this green bar here. About 30% of the adults uh, had respiratory symptoms. About half had issues with sleep. 
Um, and if you look at diabetes, that was in about 25% of adults. So this is, again, from the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, digestive issues were about 35% of the time reported, and they ranged from constipation to diarrhea and also some complaints of belly pain. So again, not that uncommon, but if you also look at regular adults, regular adults, common, the most, reason, most common reason why an adult goes to see a GI person is not because they're really excited about having a colonoscopy. All right, it's mainly because you have kind of irritable bowel symptoms. All right, and then if we, we actually looked with the help of FPWR um, to take a fresh look at the prevalence um, of these type of symptoms, and this is from the uh, registry that was filled out with the kindness of, of patients and families. So again, looking at reflux symptoms, reflux symptoms were reported, again, at the bottom in light green, it says under two years of age, so younger children, um, red bar is over two years of gauge, and then the orange just says how it was it happening every day. So you can imagine that uh, a baby who's having reflux symptoms, it's going to be a daily event, right? Babies spit up. Um, for an older child or an adult, it may be more of an intermittent symptom. And you can see out of that pool of patients, um, roughly about 140 patients, re families reported that their young child had some reflux symptoms. May have been very early in life, could have been you know, under two years of age again, but that's a common thing that other kids can have. Um, having issues with reflux in an older child or an adult was still reported roughly in about maybe 15 or 20 percent of the patients. And then again, the, the frequency was more common in young children. Then if we look at rumination, rumination is um, a symptom that's sometimes seen in older children and adults. It's where um, somebody will you know, have eaten a meal and they may bring back up a little bit of the food that was there. And that's been seen before in other patients with developmental disabilities, and it is sometimes seen in prader willi syndrome. Again, not very common. You can see from that bar that that issue was reported only in a very small number of patients. 500 people filled this out. It was in 20. So again, not very, relatively rare, um, but there. And then gastroparesis, which is something that got a lot of traction in the prader willi community about 10 years ago. Um, but that's, again, a diagnosis of gastroparesis is extremely uncommon in young infants, and I'd say that's the same way in other kids. And then in older children and adults, roughly maybe about 10% of patients that had filled this out, the families reported they had slow stomach emptying. Gallstones, again, not very common, relatively rare. Constipation, again, very common in kids that don't have prader willi syndrome um, that are between about two and five years of age. If you look at a standard GI physician's practice, we see a lot of patients with ref infants with reflux. We see a lot of toddlers with toilet training issues, and then also older boys that have issues with toilet training uh, or with, with constipation. So again, in this population here, in young infants, it was reported in roughly about 15% of that whole population had some issues with constipation under two years of age. That number rose to roughly about 20% that reported some issues with constipation that required treatment, and that was in over two years of age. And there were regular issues with constipation in roughly about 15% of the population. Diarrhea, a little less common. Again, you can see those issues at the bottom there. And then complaints of belly pain. Infants aren't gonna really complain about belly pain, but complaining about some, some tummy pain in older kids was maybe in about 10% of the population. But it wasn't typically a daily occurrence. So again, this just gives you a little bit of the background. Um, and then if we look at you know, information from data, just to give you an idea of kind of the relevance and the uh, severity of this, this is actually looking at uh, prader willi syndrome international data, looking at causes of death. And this is looking at pooled published data, both from Europe, Australia, Japan, and the US. And um, if you go to the bars there, having aspiration or choking issues is in the, the very light green bar. Um, diarrhea is the red bar. The orange bar is pneumonia, which some of that pneumonia could be related to either getting an infection or having a choking spell and having stuff go down in the lungs. And then having kind of cardiac or respiratory or sleep apnea would be in the, the blue bar. So again, I'd say there could be a tie-in for choking, swallowing, and GI type of stuff. And roughly, um, again, in young children under five for a cause of morbidity or mortality in roughly about 25% of the patients. Okay. All right. And then if we look at adults, that whole thing is going to change because it's a different dynamic. And if you look at causes of death in adults, um, strokes, again, is the kind of, uh, I'm trying to look at that bar to give you an idea what that color is. It's kind of more of a yellowish green. Um, the more kind of pea green would be um, having issues with, um, I'm looking at my thing to make sure I'm reading it right, issues with, uh, I think that's also, I think that's both stroke and, uh, and pneumonia. And then having dark green, that's the aspiration. I wish I had a pointer, but I do not. 
Um, and then having accidental uh, causes of death would be, again, roughly about 10%. If I take all that together and I walk over to the slide, oh, wow, I have somebody's, oh, it does? Oh, thank you, okay, sorry, I didn't think it did, but okay, thank you for that. All right, yeah. So again, aspiration, relatively uncommon here. Accidental deaths, which would be the, oops, sorry, I'm moving ahead. Accidental deaths would be this kind of burgundy bar right here. This thing is not working very well today. Uh, accidental deaths would be in this burgundy bar here. That would be roughly about 15%. So again, GI-related causes among adults would be a small number, would be directly GI-related, indirectly maybe with accidents. If somebody went food-seeking and they choked, I'd say maybe 10 or 15% of the causes. More of them are cardiopulmonary in, in nature. Uh, and then if we look at data from PWSA USA, um, we have accidental causes here, roughly 9%. Um, having cardiac causes would be about 10%. Ch directly related to choking, 6%. Um, directly GI related, 6%. Uh, actually, really 6 plus 3, which would be 9%. And then respiratory is roughly about half the causes. Again, I'm not trying to scare people. This just gives you kind of the background for kind of how common things are. And, then, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about the anatomy of the GI tract. So that gives you an idea how common things are. And when we look at GI, we actually start with the, the journey of food. Um, so food, you, you take it in your mouth. Everybody had lunch. Hopefully it was, everybody enjoyed it. Um, when, you, when you take that in your mouth, the first thing that you do is you put it through your lips, and then you bring it into the mouth, and then you have something called saliva that helps you lubricate it, and you're moving it around with your tongue, right? And then you start chewing a little bit, and that chewing is masticating it to get that bolus of solid food to a place where you can actually take it to the back of your mouth, and then you can, you can take it safely back to get it into the esophagus. And that whole, that whole thing takes five seconds. And that's for solid food. For liquid food, it's even faster. It's three. Like if you're drinking something, you do all of that very quick. And then after it gets into the esophagus, it goes through here. Um, and nothing really happens in the esophagus. It's just really a transit transit passageway to get it into the stomach. In the stomach, it stays in there. There's some stomach acid that's present. It does a little bit of mild digestion of food, and then the stomach acts as a little bit of a churning bag to then allow the food eventually to pass into the intestines where you absorb nutrition. Um, it goes through the small intestines and goes into the large intestines, and you can see that the large intestine has lumps on it or wrinkles because that's where it stays, and you take a little more fluid out of it, and then eventually it comes out the bottom here. Hopefully this is not going to be too gross for this type of talk. Um, so if we kind of take our journey through there, um, kind of like if you were at Disney and you're going on a ride, so we're going to go on a little bit of a, a, a toboggan ride through the gut, pretending like we just had our lunch and we're, we're taking a trip. So we're going to talk first about common oral issues. Um, you're getting on the ride, you're going to get started. So the first part of that ride that's a little bit of a problem is that you can have some weakness of the jaws. And that's related to probably two things. One is the muscles that actually allow the start of that journey which they're all up in this area and right towards the back here, they're all skeletal muscle. And what do we know about Prader Blue syndrome? They have weak skeletal muscle. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's the first part of the journey. And then the second thing is actually when you're starting to take that ride, that palate is not normal. So if you look at the palate in Prader Blue syndrome, it's high, which then doesn't allow you know, typically a very smooth transit back. It's higher so that it makes it harder for you to get that solid food to go through your mouth. Okay, make sense? And then if we look at it as you get a little bit older, um, you know, you're starting to chew things or you're also trying to suck, and the jaw medically is called micronathia. Oftentimes they have a smaller jaw. Um, so that small jaw makes it harder for you. One, you sometimes have to use special type of devices to be able to suck. And then two, it also causes more issues if you're trying to chew and swallow you know, and masticate the food. And if we look at Prader Willi syndrome, they typically have smaller teeth. The teeth may come in a little bit later, and oftentimes the enamel's a little bit weaker. So that's going to make you, just like you have weak bones in other places, your teeth can be a little bit weaker. Uh, and then there also can be, you have a smaller jaw, there's less space in the apartment complex for those friends to move in. So you get some dental crowding, and then you can also have issues if you don't have the normal amount of saliva, and you also maybe have some acid that's coming up from in your stomach of having some um, erosion of enamel. And that can also happen too if you're drinking a lot of kind of sweet drinks and you have weaker enamel. And then if we actually look at information that was published um, from, from some dental colleagues in New York, it was done once and then re, reassessed in about 20 years later, they looked at the flow of saliva in Prader Willi syndrome, and it was only about 20 to 50 percent of normals. So again, so you've got that whole kind of neighborhood when you're starting to take that ride, 
and that ride is going to be a little bit harder for a little bit more rocky for the journey. Make sense so far? So you're learning a little physiology here. Okay. All right. And then if we look at the phases of swallowing, you then have that part here that we talked about, and then you're moving into the prelude into the oral part. Then you're going to move into the pharynx, which is this little neighborhood here, and you go into the esophagus. Um, so I, I'm going to talk for just a second, just because I don't have a lot of time. I can't go into a ton of physiology, but just to give you an idea of kind of what you can do for these type of things in infants and kind of what type of, what type of interventions help. So we actually looked a while back, because my campaign as a GI person is to try to make sure if we're doing a procedure, we do it for the right reasons. I may live in Texas. I have these stupid boots on because you know, I, I like them, but I also don't want to wear them all the time but I don't like to be um, a, a procedure cowboy. So I try to get my friends to get off the horse sometimes and not you know, do procedures when we shouldn't be. So the way to do that with physicians is usually to give them data, and then sometimes you have to hit them over the head with it a few times. Um, so we, started, we looked back, and this was roughly about 20 years ago, where we pulled the data on all the infants that we had with, with PWS, and then we looked at, well, okay, if we do some things, can we cut the amount of time they're having an NG tube down? So then maybe, because typically for a GI provider or a surgeon, if you're going to have to put plumbing in, you want it to make sure it has to stay at least for three months because you don't want to, you know, go back and, and pull the plumbing out. Because we're plumbers. I mean, okay. Yeah. We, we, stick, you know, we fix pipes and we do that type of stuff. So when we looked at it, um, you can see there, um, we looked at what happens if, you, if I give an infant some occupational and physical therapy. Generally, if I do that, I can limit the amount of time that I have that NG tube into six weeks, right? Isn't that nice? See, it's nice evidence. Yeah, we published this stuff. This is actually already published. It's in, we put that in the mansion of prader Willi syndrome. I think it went in the third edition. It, it got put in again to this one. Yeah, I was just, uh, I'm also lazy, so I just didn't write the manuscript for that. So it's, but it's in the book. It's already published. There's references for that. I just didn't get to publishing that one out into a journal. Um, that's probably why it took me longer to become a full professor, but that's okay. I'm cool with that. Um, and then we also then looked at, uh, yeah, I, I do, we do nutrition as part of my specialty. So there's some things you can do to manipulate um, the feeds. So you can get more bang for your buck, you know, by, by you know, using something that's a little more concentrated. You can do that by formula or by augmenting breast milk. So you can do it either way. And that way, typically breast milk or formula is 20 calories per ounce. If you use some of the specialized preemie formulas, they go up to 22, but there are ways you can manipulate that and make it 24 calories per ounce, 26. All you're doing is you're just kind of adding some stuff. You're not adding sugar because everybody's sweet enough, um, but you can do things to kind of modify that. So if I do that, then if I have somebody who's close to getting off a tube, if I just kind of do that little extra, I can cut the amount of effort they have to get in so that I can get them off. And when we did that, if you, if you didn't do any of that and didn't see a dietitian, it took about three and a half to four months to get off. But with doing that also, it got you down to roughly about 48 days. So again, that's getting under that 90-day that mark. And then if we did both of those, it dropped it even, even more. It got it down to roughly about 35 or 36 days by just doing those manipulations. Oh, and there we go again. Okay, sorry about that. All right. So that's, again, infants. And then what about for older kids? What's the data? Is there still problems? Well, you guys know this. Um, so if we look at a, uh, looking at how common is choking in older children and adults, it's something we always worry about. You know, you can, everybody's kind of looking around here at the, at the conference to make sure nobody's you know, sneaking food. Well, we looked in uh, 2008, um, David Stevenson and I, along with the help of, of Jana Lee Heinemann um, and Norma, we went back and looked at the old data from the old morbidity and mortality data from PWSA USA, and then went through all of that, you know, and families were gracious enough to share that information. I think there were about 152 patients that were listed in there, and about 39% of these families that had shared the information had reported that um, there was a history of choking among 50, 52 of the families that completed a questionnaire. So again, they were doing it sometimes, and then if we looked at the cause of death, in roughly 8% of all the families, they had reported choking was directly related to the, related to the cause of death. Average age of those uh, patients that had that happen was 24, with a range between 3 and 52 years, and at least 92% of them were males. Yeah. Uh, and if we look at what would predispose to that, so... <laughs> Um, factors predisposing to choking are, you know, hyperphagia foraging, about 25% of them had a direct history of food seeking. The, then again, if we go back to the anatomy that I talked to you about when you're taking that ride, um, the saliva is thick. So if you put something in your mouth, you know, like, I got nothing in there, you know, it's going to be harder to get it back. 
Um, and then if you also have weaker muscles in the pharynx, it's also going to make it a little bit harder if you if you snuck something to get it down. And then the other thing that can happen though is if you have um, inflammation in the esophagus, it's going to make sometimes the esophagus spasm. So then it's also going to make things hang up. And about uh, three out of the eight, again, very small number there, had some inflammation in the stomach reported on autopsy, suggesting that there may have been something there that was also making it harder to get things down. So it's going to make it more likely for you to have a choking episode that could be significant. Everybody okay so far? I haven't, I, I don't want, uh, you're looking a little, little scared there. Don't be, yeah, no, you're okay. I know, no, I know, I know, I'm just saying, okay, all right, okay, yeah, now I understand. Well, and I do have to say out of, I mean, I, I volunteer at a camp, and so please keep it quiet. There's nobody here with PWS that's going to be at that camp this year. But at the camp, I'd say the, 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 the kids with PWS who are always telling me, like, Dr. Scheim, you already had yours. You can't have another one. I'm going to be there again this year, so it's usually the boys that come to you. It's like, you already had one. You can't have a second one. It's like, no. Yeah. So, all right. All right, so if we then look at... Um, so I'm telling you choking happens, but if we look at, you know, what is published data that's already out there about looking at swallowing um, in adults and children with prader syndrome, there was a nice study that was published um, in 2014 out of Pittsburgh um, by Roxanne Gross and Dave Chirpies, and this was published in 2015. It was uh, funded in 2014 by PWSA USA, where they actually looked at swallow studies in adults with PWS that were seen in Pittsburgh, and I think this is pretty telling. Um, they used thin liquids and a barium cookie in 30 adults, and they also saw significant, sometimes a lot, uh, in that area right past the mouth, pharyngeal res residue in 29 out of the 30 people, with you know, stuff hanging up in the esophagus in 100% of them. And then I think the key is that, again, if you're living with it, you don't recognize there's a problem. None of them actually said they could feel anything sitting there. There was no problem. Um, so yeah. So I'd say, I, I think if you look at all that stuff, the saliva is not changing, you know, so uh, that just gives you a little bit of a warning that that pro stuff is probably going on a little bit. So whenever there's something like that, it's like, well, what can I do to fix it? Well, there's some interventions that you can use. So who in the audience knows how to give a Heimlich maneuver? Okay, great, perfect. Uh, so doing that, and you can even, that's why I have this chair up here, you can even... Um, by just using the edge of a chair, because what you're trying to do is increase intra-abdominal pressure like this. Again, I don't want to throw up, uh, but you can learn how to do that. But I'd say anybody who's caring for PWS patients or if you have a caregiver, you should make sure they know how to do that. So that, I mean, it's everybody, if you work in a restaurant, you're working, hopefully the people here know how to do that, I hope. Um, but if you're doing anything, you know, where you have somebody who has a risk for choking or dysphagia, it makes sense to make sure that you've done that training. And then there are other things you can do with a diet, okay? One is supervised meals. Two is monitoring at the holidays. I mean, everybody should anyway. Nobody should be going there with elastic pants on just figuring, oh, I'm going to just go ahead and have at it, right? Yeah, okay. And then um, using meal pacing and chewing. You know, I, I have to tell it to regular kids, you know, because the kids nowadays, they, they want to get done quickly so they get back to their video games. Like, what the heck? It's like, you sit down. And you take your time. You enjoy that meal. You pace and chase, right? Yeah, and, you know, if you have a regular kid with, with PWS, it's really hard to get them to do that. But regular kids, like if you have a kid with PWS and a sibling, you can make them both do it. Make the sibling use their non-dominant hand. It makes you slow down. You can't eat that fast. Or make them eat with chopsticks. That's even worse, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then also, so again, that's talking about how do you handle solids and get it to go down that ride, right? But then with liquids, using a straw. If you're using a straw, if you think about, I told you it only takes three seconds to get the fluid back. Using a straw, it helps you pace it, right? So you can kind of then do a little bit more self-regulation than using a cup. Um, so I'd say those would be some simple things. And then also, if there's some symptoms of reflux, again, what we want to do then is we want to treat the reflux, right? So that, that way it's going to help. One, it's going to cut down on pain or discomfort. And two, it's going to actually make that esophagus work better. Make sense? Yeah. Yes. Uh, actually, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll take a question now, but then we'll take. We'll wait till the end for the others. But you're fine. Go ahead. Uh huh. Um. So uh, there are some. There are some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Oh sure. So uh, so number one, we're gonna save questions till the end. But but there are some ways that that you, we can do that, and we'll we'll just wait till the end, and I'll I'll talk about that if that's okay. Thank you for reminding me to do that. I, I needed a prompt for that. I apologize. I have ADD. Okay. Okay. All right. 
Okay. Let's see if I get this to work. Okay. All right. So again, I mentioned, you know, inter intervention. So again, treatment. So how do you treat reflux? You know, one of them is, you know, using conservative measures by just watching how much you're eating, elevating the head of the bed at night, because at night you're not going to swallow the saliva down, which is going to be a buffer, minimizing caffeine. Yeah. And then also looking at the amount of fat in the diet. You just want to modify that. It's going to slow down emptying a little bit. And there are also some medications that we use. So we use antacids. So a lot of, so a simple thing to think about also would be, a lot of kids with PWS, their diets are going to be low in calcium, right? So a simple thing that could be a twofer is you can use calcium carbonate. That's a source of calcium, low calorie, right? It can be a twofer because you can use that for reflux. It helps a little bit with heartburn. It's not perfect, but it's also going to be a source of calcium, right? Make sense? Um, and then also sometimes we'll use medications for reflux, again, if, if it's needed, if, it, if it's indicated, um, with using you know, acid blockers or using, for somebody who has significant reflux who's probably seen a GI provider, sometimes we use stronger medicines than that. Um, and then I put at the bottom there in a little bit of italics, something called, does anybody know what helicobacter pylori is? All right, all right, I just wanna, yeah, so, oh, even our orthopedist in the back, kudos, man, you rock. Okay, all right, so this is something because a lot of kids with PWS are um, staying in environments. This is a very common bacteria. You know, um, it, it's, it's extremely common worldwide. And if you're in exposed to lower socioeconomic status, you know, whether you're from Central or South America, you're from the developing world, or you have contact with that, and a lot of the kids with PWS do, it's actually a cause for, for reflux because it actually affects the stomach. So if you... Uh, again, my Spanish is really bad. I know there are people out here that speak it. But if you ask for family history, um, they will say gastritis. You know, there's gastritis in the family. And if you look at evidence from, you know, developing world, about 90% of, of young infants and children have been exposed to this bacteria. This bacteria can, can live in your stomach for years. And so it can be definitely something that if your child has reflux symptoms um, or if there's a family history of that, you can test for that by getting your poop checked. Yeah, and that's an easy one. If it comes back positive, then I would definitely recommend that you see a GI provider, you know, before you go and treat something, you know, to make sure that's really appropriate to treat. Um, but that would be something that would be worthwhile to consider screening for. Um, again, that's something you can, you can treat, fix, and move on. Yeah. And that's what that's at the bottom for. If you're going to screen for that, you want to look at the poop. And that's not just because I'm a GI provider, because people will look at blood work. Blood work just means you were exposed to this at some point in your life. It doesn't tell you whether you have an active infection. But, but the proof is in the, in, the, in the pooper and the shit. So, yeah, please, just, just check the shit. All right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, and see, look at that. See? Oh, yeah. Who knows this chart? Okay. Who loves this chart? Okay. Who knows that kids with PWS love this chart? They do. Yeah, you, yeah they, they totally do. Uh, and so this chart is great because you can be pooping every day and, and, um, and still have constipation. You know, I mean, my husband, my husband has brown eyes. I tell him every day that he's really full of it, and that's not really why. I think that's why God made people have brown eyes. So if you do, then you know, God bless you, but I think you're full of it, but that's not true. So anyway, anyway, this is an easy way to kind of look for constipation. So if you look at this chart here, you can see on there there's type 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. I wish I would have developed this just like I wish I had developed post-it notes, but I didn't. So anyway, I just got to live with this. But it's a great Christmas gift. You give this out with some coffee. It's great. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. Okay. So like if you look, so this gives you a little bit of an idea how the colon works. Um, because the colon, what it does, it takes fluid out of the poop, right? So the longer the poop stays in there, the more fluid that gets taken out. It starts to look, you know, like the shape of the colon. Um, so as you go up like three, two, and one, that's actually staying in there longer. It's allowing the colon to stay more stretched out. So you can, again, be pooping every day, but still have constipation. Uh, and it, an easy way to think about it also is that who has wrinkles, old people or young people? That's how I talk to kids. They always say, oh, old people. Don't like, see, that, that's what your poop is. It's got that in there. Okay. All right, so um, how does this happen? Okay, so this happens because there's a whole process of getting the poop out. Again, we've taken that ride you know, through the stomach, and we've gone through the intestines, we've absorbed what we're gonna absorb out of there, and then we get down to the bottom. And at the bottom here, we have these muscles, right? You see this muscle here, you see these kind of muscles here, these are something called the pelvic floor muscles, okay? And then what happens is, when you're walking around, 
these muscles are kind of pulled away so that you don't have an accident, right? And then when you need to go to the bathroom, if you line up everything so that you're sitting on the chair, this is why I have this up here. Hopefully this works, yeah. Okay. So now if I'm sitting on the chair, like when I went to my grandma's house, she had an outhouse, okay? Everybody know what an out, anybody know what an outhouse is? Oh yeah, okay. My grandma had one of those. I hated going there. And I didn't really know why, because I'm short, but it was also really hard, because when I went there, my feet were way up in the air, okay? And I had to go to the bathroom, and it, it was hard. It was really hard to go. It was gross anyway, but it was hard. And part of that, there's a physiologic reason for that, and it also, I think, impacts PWS. One, they have weak muscles, and two, you know, they tend to be a little bit shorter. But then when you're lined up like that, you're then trying to poop at an angle. You're trying to get that stuff to come out, and you got weaker muscles, and it's not going to come out the straight way, right? Make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right, so again, I'm laying the background there, giving you a little bit of physiology. You're not even GI fellows. See, you guys could do a fellowship with me. Come on up. Yeah, so how common is, is this in prader Lee syndrome? Well, it's common in regular people, so it's also common in PWS. So there was a paper that, two papers that were published in 2014 um, where they looked at, I think this is from Scandinavia, um, individuals with PWS that were, had a median age of uh, 32 and they were not obese, and they were at a, a Scandinavian rehab, re, uh, rehab center. They looked at how common was constipation, they did a rectal exam, and they measured the rectal diameter by ultrasound. And then they looked at how quickly stuff goes through their colon. And then they compared that to 30 patients that were healthy, that were a little bit younger, were about the same weight. And what they found for symptoms was um, infrequent stools in PWS was about half of the time. And we define constipation as, as pooping probably every three days. I mean, it's within the normal range to go daily to every other day. We get to the third day, it's stretching out the rectum, and it's, it's within the range of constipation. Uh, and then having straining to go was in about 40% of the patients. And then reporting heart stools was in about 30% of the patients. Then they looked at, well, was there a difference in size of the rectum? Maybe that's why. Or, you know, were things moving slower through the colon in prader syndrome versus normal people? And they didn't see any difference in that. So for a lot of patients with prader syndrome, it's something that we call normal transit constipation, meaning that if I eat some corn, which we don't feed PWS patients that, I'm going to see it come out in, the, in my poop in about the standard time. Um, and then they did look at um, the PWS adults through a questionnaire study and found about 30% of them reported some constipation as well. What, is the, what are the things that con contribute to constipation? It can be you know, having some developmental delay, um, having you know, issues with situations. You know, uh, again, these are more common in regular folks. Uh, in PWS, the things that are going to be relevant would be developmental delay, um, having issues with decreasing fluid intake, because that's going to be less for the, the colon to pull out, so it's going to make it harder. Hypothyroidism. So I'd say if this is coming up all of a sudden, let's say your kid's on Depakote or is on lithium, maybe they suddenly become hypothyroid, and you didn't realize it. Is that something you can fix? The thyroid hormone actually affects transit through the gut, so I'd say make sure you get the thyroid checked. And then the structural problem with you know, positioning to go to the bathroom, um, and then also decreased muscle tone. Those are all things in P that would be PWS related that contribute to constipation. And how do we help with that? Um, we're going to do some things to help with stooling, um, with using some, some medications, you know, as well as some other maneuvers. And then we want to make sure we're looking at the posture for seating. You want to make sure the feet aren't dangling at the toilet, right, when, you, when it comes time to toilet train. We definitely want to use a seating system so it's going to give somebody good posture so that they're actually able to sit. Things are in the appropriate lineup so that you're getting the most out of muscles. And then I'm going to suggest something else if I have it in the slide. Okay, now I have this here, so I'm going to go back. So one other thing that to me makes sense in PWS, um, for somebody who's old enough, if they're having trouble with going to the bathroom, then looking at doing some special type of physical therapy called pelvic floor physical therapy, um, it really can help if you're having a lot of trouble with going because the muscles are weak. And again, for the right patient, it can show them kind of some exercises they can do to strengthen up the muscles. Because again, if you've not really learned the appropriate way, you may, be have, you may have some issues with defecation just because you haven't learned the right technique, and it can be very valuable. All right, so this is actually an algorithm that um, Jim Loker and I, he did a lot of the work, again, I'm lazy, um, helped develop, which looks at kind of management of constipation for the emergency room and also how to manage GI complaints. Are people aware of this algorithm? Yeah, so please, feel, please use it you know, if you go to the emergency room. They like it. And then has anybody heard of something called up-to-date? Okay. 
you need to know that those three words up to date. Everybody got it? You know why? Because physicians are lazy, but we go look at up to date. Okay. So if you go into the emergency room, just remember those words. You, you look at the algorithm and you say up to date. I wrote the chapter <laughs> with, with Jessica Dweese and then also somebody from Scandinavia. It's very easy. It goes through a lot of the key features of Prader Release Syndrome, whether it's GI related or not. Yeah. Okay, I can't do anything for you right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, all right. Okay. All right, so interventions for constipation um, that would be relevant to PWS. So you can do some things that would be diet related. You can add flax seed. You can use chia seeds. Are people familiar with those? Uh, and then magnesium supplements. There's something called milk of magnesium that's been around forever. But there's also calm, natural calm magnesium powder, which is magnesium citrate. You can use those. Those actually help a little bit with stimulating the colon, you know, to go. It's not addictive or habit forming. I tend to avoid using two laxatives in particular, and I'll mention them, so that if you see a GI pro provider, they're asking to use those, and please have them send me a message. The two of them, and you'll know why, one of them is something called lactulose, which is a sweet sugar. Do we want to use that? Why? It's Prater Willie. I mean, uh, I, I, see, I see some patients, I'm like, oh, they tell me, oh, why did you do that? And the other one is x -Lax chocolate. <laughs> they like it. Is that a good choice? No, no, oh no, because you know, one, of, one of the kids with PWS kept telling the GI physician um, who's in a different state, um, uh, he just, the kid kept needing more and more. They said it just wasn't working. So then they just kept pushing the dose up. I think you know, usually we'll go to like one or two squares, uh, you know, for a normal kid, one or two squares a day. The kid was up to six. And I'm like, it's not working. There's, the kid was still complaining. I'm like, oh, I can, we know why. <laughs> yeah, so we try to stay away from that one. Okay. All right, and then the other one that's on here, and again, this is not, there's not an FDA approval, it's approved for constipation in general. Miralax, anybody heard of that? Okay, it is safe, yeah, and again, I, yeah, there's stuff on the internet that just says it can cause, it's like uh, using polyethylene glycol, you know, that it's, it's an antifreeze, it's safe, you know, so if, if you, there's been studies that were done out of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Nationwide Children's Hospital where they looked, there was no, no elevation in that. The key thing with Miralax is that you have to look at, look at it like a shot with a chaser. All right? Everybody know what a shot with a chaser is? Okay. All right. So the way it works is it just pulls fluid in. So if your child with PWS is a sipper, it is not going to work because you have to take like a capful or two capfuls in with at least six to eight ounces of fluid within 20 minutes. If it's taking out, you know, to be safe, if it's taking a very long time, it's just not going to work. That's the way the medicine works. So that's, I mean, when I tell adult, adult with a chaser, people get it. Yeah, so, yeah. All right. Okay, um, everybody okay so far? This is a, a little transition slide here. Uh, and so then I'm gonna talk a little bit about this part, which would be another part of constipation. People have heard of, you know, having rectal ulcers or rectal digging, okay? Um, and this is not a common thing, but happens in some kids with PWS. And I think the key here is that you wanna look at why it happened. And I think I know why, you know, again, PWS have, you know, cognitive rigidity, right? And so I think what, what can happen in PWS is that there are um, issues with, with toileting and, and learning how to sit appropriately on the toilet. And then there's a component in stool that's called bile acids. You don't need to know that word, but bile acids are really itchy. Oh, see? Everybody gets it. They cause itching and burning. Yep. That's why, like, if you get, again, this is for adults. If adults get a hemorrhoid, they use things that kind of cut down on burning, swelling, and inflammation. So I think that may be why it happens in PWS. So I've done some things to try to help with that. Um, and so what you want to do then, if this has come up, is we want to fix the issue, right? And the way we're going to fix the issue is we want that poop to be soft so that it's not hard to come out. We want to relearn how we toilet because we probably didn't learn, you know, the normal way. So we're using, we're putting, our, again, if people are getting grossed out, I apologize. So I will, I'm not going to give you like a demo of it. But uh, I think, you know, it, all right, that, that'd be a little bit much. Okay. Yep. All right. So, um, you know, if you're having trouble going, then you might try to help yourself go to the bathroom. So if you've started that process, it can cause irritation in the rectum. So what we want to do then is relearn what we didn't learn right. Okay. And so then making that poop really soft and then doing some pelvic floor PT to relearn kind of how I should be going to the bathroom to kind of help and then work with a psychologist to break the, break the cycle of the habit. 
And then there's another thing that I will use um, sometimes to actually help with itching, but I'm not recommending people start this, and I'll explain why. There is a chemical called cholestyramine or questran, which helps bind up bile acids, okay? But the problem with that, if you just use it on your own, is that it interferes with the absorption of vitamins that help with your, that are related to fat absorption. Everybody hear vitamin D? Yeah, okay, so that's one of those. There's something called vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin E, and vitamin K. You take this stuff in on just a regular basis without a good reason for it, it can cause deficiencies in those vitamins. And in PWS, we know they're at risk for breaking bones, so we definitely don't want to just go ahead and use this willy-nilly. But I'm just telling you that that's one of the other things we use, and I think there's a physiologic basis for why that happens. Um, all right, okay, everybody okay so far? I haven't lost my voice yet. And time-wise, am I okay? I don't know who my timer is. Oh, cool, cool, okay, cool, all right, great. All right, so there's a constipation alert that, that Dr. Loker and I put out, and now I'm gonna talk about big stomachs, okay? All right, I got enough time, great. All right, so going through the timeline of that, um, this is non-PWS. It was first described back in 1883 um, by a French, we have French people in the back, I think. Uh, Simone Emmanuel Duplay, did I do okay? They're in the back, last row, I know they're back there. Was my French okay there? Okay, good, thank you so much, appreciate that. Okay, I know you're back there, I see you. Um, uh, and then if you look at physiology in dogs, it's related to kind of stretching and then twisting of the stomach along an axis where the stomach becomes big and it shouldn't. And then in 1959, um, there was a British investigator, actually 1859, my bad, uh, who suggested that there may be a problem with inhibition of nerves that allows stomach to increase in size rather than being decompressed. And there's a thought that some of this problem actually comes from a problem in the hypothalamus with something called the solitary nucleus, which is kind of where messages come from the gut up to the brain. Makes sense, it could be related to PWS. This has also been reported in anorexia and bulimia, where somebody who's gotten undernourished then has belly pain after meals, and it's usually related to having a binge, and then there may be some bacteria in the gut that kind of leak into that stretched out stomach and cause issues. And it's also been reported in Rett syndrome, which Rett syndrome was mentioned during the meeting as something else that's been worked on as far as genetics, so not just related to PWS. Not very common in Rett syndrome, but it's also been reported there. And then what about, uh, Mm, hang on, I think I went the other way. Yeah, I think I did. Okay. What about in Prader Willi syndrome? So there was a wonderful gentleman who did a lot of work uh, who lived up in New England. His name was Bob Wharton. Anybody heard of him? Yeah. So he published a really key paper, I think, that um, is, is important for folks with in the Prader Willi community to be aware of. It was in 1997, where he described six women with vomiting and gastroenteritis who developed rapidly progressive gastrodilatation followed by necrosis of the stomach. Two of the kids actually had this resolve. One patient passed away because bacteria got out of the stomach into the bloodstream and they got a bad infection. And then three of them had to have part of their stomachs resected. And then, um, I, unfortunately, I don't think this person read the paper, but in, in around the same time, there was a guy who did surgery on a Prader Willi patient who was in his like mid thirties and decided to make his stomach smaller. So he, he put a band around it and then yeah, told him he could go home and then just eat. So yeah, he didn't, so that patient um, had a, a gastric band placed and then passed away like six weeks later from having a gastric dilatation and necrosis. Yeah, so again, so th those are a, a couple examples. And then if we look at more recent data, again, back in that same paper where I talked about the choking, um, David Stevenson and I looked at, you know, kind of this issue in PWS, just looking at more current stuff from the morbidity and mortality data. And then four patients, which would be roughly about 5% passed away from gastric rupture and necrosis, and another 3% were headed suspected. So that makes a total of about 5 to 7%. And there's some common themes here that I think you could take away. One was a teenager who was not overweight, who had been binge eating on a holiday, binge eating holiday, right? Followed by belly pain and vomiting, okay? Um, and then there were two non-obese young adults who had belly pain and vomiting. And then there was a middle-aged uh, adult who had a history of an ulcer, again, something bothering the stomach, uh, with inflammation in the stomach. And then there was another child with belly pain who threw up some blood. So I think there's some common themes to take away from that so that if you're seeing some symptoms, again, I'm not trying to scare people. Uh, that, is not my, that is not my role. Usually people are laughing during my talks, but I, that is not my job to, to, to do that to you. Um, and then there was actually a more recent one that talked about a 36-year-old who had Prader Willi syndrome who was mildly overweight, had been in a group home with good control, went to the ER with belly pain and vomiting after a binge eat, had a dilated stomach, had some antibiotics, went home, and then seven months later had the same thing happen again. And with this one, he um, got a little bit sicker from that, you know, and then did, did survive it. Um, he had a scope done that showed food in the stomach, 
uh, and then you know had still dilatation of the stomach. So to try to handle that, because this kept happening, they put in a stomach tube so we could vent. So this, if this happened again, they had a way to vent his stomach. Again, that, that's another way that it could be managed. I think if you look at it, um, what we want to do is make sure we're being, ah, perfect. Good, OK. We'd want to look at some diet strategies to help with stomach emptying if this is there. Again, if you don't have symptoms, don't do this, right? Uh, but you want to do things in moderation. You want to make sure the meals are appropriate. You want to have a moderate amount of fiber. You want to make sure protein is a priority, which it should be anyway in PWS. You want to make sure there's lots of fluid because that will empty well. Make sure foods are well chill chewed. And then you want to make sure that you're doing things to help with stomach emptying. Exercise is a great thing. It helps with muscle tone. It also helps your gut. That's why if you have surgery, they get you up right away. Not because they're trying to be mean, but they're trying to avoid blood clots. Oh, and our ortho person's not even... Don't we let... <laughs> Dr. Von Boss, don't we have people get right up after surgery as soon as possible to get them moving? See? There we go. Not just for blood clots, but it also gets your gut moving. Yep. All right. Okay, so um, to finish up, again, I think the world is full of challenges. And I, that's actually why I got into this space, also because I love PWS. Uh, um, but with those come opportunities, and I look at it as an opportunity. So I'll take some questions. I did a little bit of a quick tour there. Um, and if anybody has questions, feel free to ask. But I just would ask uh, to keep your questions somewhat general. Yeah, not, but I, I can't give like specific medical advice, but I can give kind of general stuff. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm curious about when you talked about constipation being kind of one of the common things. You had a slide that talked about, you know, with regards to emptying stomachs. Um, when it comes to children, small children, you said constipation is kind of typical for that age. Yeah. Um, probably because of the positioning, which you kind of went into a little bit later. But if it's not any of those things, is there something else associated with that? Um, so I think you're asking about anything else besides, you know, typical, you know, um, things related. So in young children, issues with constipation can be partly related to, you know, kind of learning control of the, there's two valves, there's an internal valve and an external valve, you know, in your gut, so that when you're a baby, you, you have to poop, it comes out in the diaper, you know, and it doesn't stay in there. But when you get to be somewhere, again, for normal kids, somewhere between about 14 months to about three years of age, there's an external valve so that if you're running around, you can hold the poop in and not let it come out. Okay, so that's normal, mm -hmm. um, but there can be other things that can, and around that same time, we change our diet. So you're learning control of a valve, we change our diet, let, a little less fluid because you're not taking in as much pureed foods, more solid okay. foods, okay. so that's going to change the amount of fluid that's present. Okay. So those would be kind of normal things in the background. There are other things, I mentioned a couple constipating conditions in there, and that would be relevant to PWS, one would be hypothyroidism. Right. There are a variety of other things, like you can have a problem with your back, with muscles in the back or the spine. You can have issues with muscle strength or tone. There are a variety of other things that can be contributors. But for the most part in kids, the common buckets would be the common buckets. Mm -hmm. And with the, this is my last question. And with sure. regards to constipation kind of being some of the challenges of, with the PWS, does it take into account whether or not they were casted or bracing? Is that, well, is I, that are I, they excluded from those numbers? Sorry? Are they excluded from those numbers? No, they, they, they were in any, so that was not, it would not have been something that was excluded from the FPWR registry, no. Yeah, yeah. but it would again be a risk factor because they're not going to be ambulating as much. Yeah. Yes. Hi, I was wondering if you um, could speak a little bit about your experience with bees oh. um, and, okay. and sort of like how perhaps to speak to some of your colleagues. I, my daughter almost had emergency abdominal surgery last year. Uh -huh. uh, and then secondly, I was wondering if you ever test for SIBO and if that might be something that is impacting like the PWS belly. Um, so SIBO is a diagnosis of exclusion. That small, what is SIBO? SIBO is small bowel bacterial overgrowth. Um, and there is normally bacterial counts in different parts of the gut. And um, there are a variety of different conditions that can cause a, a change in the amount of bacteria in the gut. I will usually look for what the other reasons are before I just attribute it to that. The way you can test for bacterial overgrowth is you get a breath test. Uh, but, but you really want to make sure you know if there, you exclude some of the other reasons for why. And so that can be based on you know, family history, you know, other type of stuff. So I will do it in, se in selected cases, but I usually will go through the other stuff first. So I'm a little bit anal. Um, that's, I think I was in GI. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I had to throw that in. Yeah. Oh, bees ors. Um, um, I, I think I'd have to talk to you offline. I don't know what type it was. I'm guessing it was food. Uh, they weren't sure what it was on x-ray. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, that'd be food. Okay, so to fight a bee, what a bee's or is it's, it's a big kind of clump. Like, let's say you eat a big salad. We have five minutes, yeah. You eat a big salad, it's just sitting in your stomach, and it just fills the stomach up. So for that, um, we usually have to wait them out. We usually try to avoid uh, an operation uh, and they use some things to irrigate the stomach. That would be a common way that it's handled. Yeah, and, and then I would assume that you probably modify the diet after that to cut down. Uh-huh. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I have a question. Sure. About a 56-year-old Prader Willie. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, he has rumination. Uh-huh. Constantly. Sure. So is that, what, what causes that, or is this because he's developed the habit? Um, so is he living with you, or is he in a group home? He's in a group home, and okay. I have his caretaker sure. here. Sure, okay, great. Um, uh, so were you here at the beginning of the talk? Yes. Okay, so did you remember seeing that stool test I talked about? Yes. Get him tested. Is that a new, new symptom, or has it been there for oh, a long no. time? Oh, no, it's forever. Okay, has he, been, has he ever been tested for that bacteria? That I'm not aware of. Okay, I'd say it's pretty common in group homes. I would get them tested because that would be something you can modify. If it's, if, if it's uh, I mean, if, if he has it, you can get him tested and get him treated for it. And that might help some with stomach emptying. And it might cut a little bit down on the, one of the, trigger for the triggers for the behavior. I have one more question. Yes. He devours his food. Sure. It's gone within five minutes. Yeah. Do you have anything that will help with slowing him down? I think that's where you'd want to work with the group home to maybe make it a group protocol that maybe you play music and then the goal is to slow it down to the music. Have you tried that? We've tried everything. I mean, I stand and to cut his food and uh -huh. hand him his food. Uh -huh. And if I'm not doing that directly, his plate is empty. Does he use the smallest type of utensils you can possibly use? I have given him tiny, tiny utensils. Um, he scoops it on the tiniest okay. spoon I've ever seen and still gets it in Well then, mouth. I think the other thing that I do with it is make sure it's really lubricated. Do you really lubricate the heck out of that food to make it really kind of mushy so that, that it's less likely to get stuck? Uh, I do, but of course at the group home, I don't know what So doing. I think that's where, if you've tried a number of different interventions and it's not working, you've talked to the psychologist again for other things to slow somebody down. I think I would, I would talk to the group home manager you know, and the dietitian there to see if there are some things you can do in particular with his food just to make it, again, if he won't pace and chase, then maybe try to liquefy the food a little bit just okay. to make it a little bit softer. But is it normal for someone to have rumination all the time? That's why I'm telling you, I look for another trigger for why there might be okay. rumination. Again, there can be. It really depends on the functional level. But I would look to see if there's something else you can fix because that might be something you could fix. Thank you. Sure, no problem. I think we have maybe... I'm going over there because sure, thank you. Her hand up for a long time. Yep. Hi, I'll try to make this quickly. Sure. Um, you were mentioning the natural calm magnesium. Yes. And I apologize, I'm kind of new to the Prada Willie world. I have a 19 month old. But if you're noticing constipation and you try the natural calm magnesium, is that something you want to keep them on or only use it as you? Uh, I would probably keep it. I would keep it on because the I would keep it on at least until your your child is is fully put you know toilet trained. Mm -hmm. You know because I, I'd say oh. at 18 months okay. there's still going to probably be issues. They're not yeah. going to be ambulating that well. I think I would keep it on as long as kidney functions normal. And that's just to the keep one the you poop just, soft. Like, mix in with the water kind of stuff. Sure, I just follow the direction. On the, okay. on the container, yeah. Okay, and then the you. key would just be you just adjust it a little bit. Okay, yeah. thank you. Sure. Okay, I think there's somebody over there. I apologize. Yeah. Hi, is there any warning against long-term use of like a stool softener for, you know, mild to chronic? No, I mean, there used to be teaching um, in the GI literature. I have one minute. Okay, I can talk really fast. There used to be teaching in the GI literature that using um, stimulant laxatives, which would be like X-lax and that, those type of things, or Dugalax, that they were a problem, but they actually are not ha habit-forming for the gut. So there is not a problem with using them, to the best of my knowledge. Yes, I think we have this young lady up here in the front who might have a question, who's had her hand up for quite a while. And I can take the last question. Yeah. So I have... Uh, you, you know, parental dysemia, and I have struggled probably since puberty. Some of it has been diabetes, but even before that, I have issues with, um, like not being able to make it in time with, with poop at certain times of the month. Uh huh. And I'm wondering, like, could could that be? 
I think like some of it's like delayed response. Is that happened with others with PWS? It happens Thank actually you know in, of. would you like to hear that's a normal thing? <laughs> would you like to hear it's normal? Other people have it? Would that be nice? Yeah. It's normal. Yeah, if you look at people, you probably have irritable bowel syndrome. It's very normal that around the time of your period that there's, there's nerves that go to the gut, that go to the pelvis, and they actually stimulate both the uterus and they also stimulate your colon. So if your stools are a little more frequent during that time, that would be something normal. But like... I have like accidents quite a bit, like certain times, like during periodically throughout the month. Sure. So I would say um, talk to your regular doctor about maybe looking at some things that could be done to help with irritable bowel syndrome. That sounds like it could be that. Again, I'm not sure, but I, I would talk to them. But that's actually a very common thing. You can be an adult and still have normal adult things. That's okay. <laughs>